everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Russell Group warm-up webinar, getting you ready for the virtual event on Wednesday the 7th of October. Today we are going to be talking about applying to Oxford and Cambridge. Minnie Beach from the University of Cambridge and Tom Trower from the University of Oxford will be joining us. Millie and Tom will be talking you through how Oxford and Cambridge differ from other UK and international universities, their student life and how to craft your application. This webinar is designed to support any students working towards the October deadline for UCAS applications, as well as to provide an introduction to our virtual event in the coming weeks. We are open to questions and we'll be answering a selection at the end of today's webinar. So please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A button on Zoom or the live chat on YouTube. If we are unable to answer your question today, we recommend registering for the Meet the Russell Group event on Wednesday the 7th of October, and that will be running from 12 o'clock till 6 o'clock in the evening. You just need to visit russellgroup.vfairs.com to register for that. We will pop the link in the chat if you're viewing on Zoom, and we'll also pop it in the YouTube chat as well. Okay, let's get started. I'm going to pass you over to Millie and Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'll, I'll let Millie go first. Hiya, um, my name is Millie and I am a student recruitment coordinator at the University of Cambridge and really excited to be here with you all today to do this presentation for you. Uh, and I'm equally excited and my name's Tom. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, an outreach delivery coordinator uh, as well as international recruitment officer for the University of Oxford uh, in the undergraduate admissions and outreach uh, department. Um, what we're going to be doing today, myself and Millie, will be um, doing a presentation first off in, in two stages. So we'll look at the why first off, and then we'll move into the how um, as well. Uh, and obviously, as, as, as Megan mentioned, there'll be a chance to ask questions at the end. Um, however, first off, um, we'll start off with the, the why uh, and, uh, and why you may think about applying to either Oxford or Cambridge. I say or. Uh, because, and this will be mentioned again, I'm sure that you can't apply to both universities in the same application cycle. Um, so first off, um, both universities offer a wide range of courses um, that are situated in the academic arts, social sciences um, and science as well, as which is medical and non-medical and engineering. Um, in most of these courses, you start by covering the subject broadly, and then you focus or specialise as you progress further on. So if you have an interest in a certain area, you may be able to pursue that in your studies again as you progress. Um, you'd also have to check entry requirements. Um, and this is quite important because obviously, depending on your chosen course, you need to make sure you meet those requirements. Um, both universities have extensive information of these requirements on, on, on our websites. Um, but the two main bits of information, I, I guess, to check as a domestic student is um, whether you meet the A-levels or the equivalent, if you're doing equivalent to, to A-levels, as well as the prerequisites needed. So, for example, at Oxford, if you want to do biochemistry, it's essential that you've studied chemistry, um, as well as another science. Maths is recommended and biology would be helpful. Um, so it's useful as part of the application. Both Oxford and Cambridge have lectures, classes, practicals, um, uh, as well as any other university would have. Um, Lectures being in a larger cohort, taught from the front on a broad topic. Uh, so currently for this year's cohort at Oxford, these are going to be conducted online. Um, then you have tutorials at Oxford or supervisions at Cambridge. Um, these are much smaller. So this could be one, two or three students with a tutor or a supervisor, usually at least once a week. And they give you a chance to go in depth into a subject area. Um, this is to aid with the learning uh, as, as well. But with regards to these smaller sessions, um, you know, they, they currently will be face to face because um, you can make sure that it's uh, COVID secure. Um, it's also worth checking um, how you'll be assessed uh, because the vast majority of courses will be assessed by essay based um, exams. However, if you take science or engineering, um, you may be assessed on your practical work too, but it really is worth seeing how you will be assessed and, uh, assessed. and that's, that's one thing to think about, especially when, you, when you're looking at these courses. And, and finally, you may choose Oxford or Cambridge um, because of the favourite uh, favourable graduate prospects. So both universities have some of the highest graduate employment rates in the UK, uh, regardless of degree subject. So many employers may not specify degree subject to look for transferable skills gained during your time at university. Um, unless, of course, you have a specific degree in mind, uh, in which case you'll need to do 
the, the degree certification for that. So the obvious one there to think about is, is medicine. Um, colleges. So both universities are collegiate. So that means that they have um, the functions of the university are administered both centrally and by each individual college. So colleges um, are a student's primary community. Um, they admit the students, they organise small group teaching, they're responsible for academic and pastoral care, they provide accommodation, uh, social activities and a places where you eat, um, which is the most important thing for me. When applying to either Oxford or Cambridge on your UCAS application, you can either indicate a preference for a college, um, or if you don't mind um, which college, you can submit an open application. Neither pathway affects your chances of going through to interview. That's very important to, to remember here. Um, it doesn't matter if you choose to have a specific college or open, that doesn't um, affect your application in any way. Um, and again, both universities have information and guidance available on our websites uh, for each virtual uh, for each college. There'll be virtual tours as well, um, which is really handy, obviously, for our current situation where you can check out one of the, the, uh, the colleges via, uh, via a VR platform or by, by on YouTube. A couple of things to consider when applying uh, for a college as well. So there's, as mentioned, there's plenty of information on, uh, on both universities' websites. Uh, however, a lot of colleges, um, sorry, thinking about the facilities that colleges have at Oxford and Cambridge, they're very similar. Um, so they provide accommodation. Uh, they'll have a JCR, um, which is both an actual room and an elected student body uh, within the college that runs social events and activities and provides support, advice services, as well as voicing student concerns about the college. So JCR is junior college, uh, junior common room. Uh, and, and as I said, it's both a, an actual physical room and a student body, uh, which you can be elected to, to run and be in. Um, but colleges will have extensive libraries and technology support, um, dining rooms and social spaces, sports facilities, uh, so gyms and playing fields and actual sports teams as well, or social clubs within that college, uh, as, as well as um, other facilities besides. So I, I, I can speak for Oxford here, but we have a website that tabulates every college and their facilities. So it has a dot matrix and you can see, you know, if there's a multi multi faith prayer room, if there's music rooms, if there's um, an orchestra, if there's a college choir, there's theatre spaces, everything it has on there, you can see. Um, where colleges differ, um, and this is where you may want to start thinking about if you want to apply to a specific college or just an open application, but if you wanted to go for a specific college, some colleges um, may have academic and pastoral college care that is college sorry um, is college specific so they may only have certain staff for certain subjects uh, which then obviously means that there'll be different subjects offered uh, you've also got um, some colleges are what well, they're varying in size so you have the larger ones uh, that have may maybe 400 plus students or smaller ones that may be looking more towards the 200 size of things uh, how they look as well so some of the buildings are ancient while others may, may be new or near new or other one uh, other older colleges are actually building new, new new structures as well so that's something to check out um, also colleges may have specific facility uh, scholarships or bursaries um, so again it's worth checking out to see if you meet criteria for a scholarship for a specific college um, and then finally location um, so both universities have colleges spread out all, all over their, their respective cities so deciding where you want to be in Oxford or, or Cambridge may swing your choice as well and I've just got a quick map that I'll show before um, hand over to Millie. So at the top here we have Cambridge and then the bottom here we have Oxford, both very different maps. Cambridge slightly easier to see with the red dots, you can see here that the dot is all around. Here you have two train stations which may be a benefit to you as well. So you can see that quite a lot of on both universities have colleges that are, that are centred around the CBD, the central business district or where this stuff happens. Um, you can't see it very clearly here at all but the train station is where um, is just to the to, to the west of all of the, um, the blocks. There's, there's, a, there's an outlier block to the west and the train station is just just next to that so again they're, they're both pretty pretty but they're very central and you can see that they're, they're spread out but again it's a chance for you to have a look and, and and find out for yourself and have a look at which college you, you may want to go to and uh, now i'm gonna i'm gonna pass over to, to millie who will um talk about a couple of other things thanks very much um so the first thing i'm going to talk about is the supportive academic environment at both oxford and cambridge some of you might be familiar with this um discussion that Oxford and Cambridge are quite intensive environments to work in. And to an extent that is true, but we do offer you a lot of support and learning opportunities throughout your time studying at the universities. And we do that in a number of ways. So firstly, we have sort of large group teaching, which Tom has already touched on. So those could be lectures, classes, seminars, and practical learning. 
Um, the practical learning would obviously sit more towards the, the sciences end of the spectrum, typically. And those will typically be with students from across a whole range of colleges. And you'll be learning with them in, in a larger setting, as you would expect. Then we have small group teaching, which at Oxford is known as tutorials and at Cambridge is known as supervisions. And that's one of the things that really makes the, the Cambridge and Oxford learning experience really unique because it provides high quality, intensive contact time with um, people who are specialists in the subjects that you're interested in. We've had a question in which just asked, what sort of things can I expect to happen in a tutorial or a supervision? And that really varies depending on the subject that you're studying. But one of the things you can expect is that you'll be in a group with probably between, I would say, at its biggest end, like five people, um, but more usually kind of two to three other students. And in that space, you will um, maybe discuss work you've been set. So you might be asked to prepare some uh, an essay or some, some reading. Um, and you can use that space to discuss that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You might be asked to create a presentation that you can share with others in the group. Um, it might be something that you've learned about in your lectures that you don't quite understand and you want to drill down further into. And, and you can have those discussions um, with whoever is leading the supervision or the tutorial. So it's a really valuable opportunity. And one of the things that our students say they really like about it is that it gives you an opportunity to really shape the tutorial or supervision depending on what your interests are so it gives you a lot of freedom to pursue um, your own individual kind of lines of inquiry so they're a really popular aspect of teaching at Oxford and Cambridge in addition we expect our students to do quite a large amount of independent study and that could be um, well generally we'll take the form of, of reading and kind of critical analysis we have, well, I can speak for Cambridge, we have over 100 libraries that our students do definitely make the most of. Um, and it's a chance to really take what you've learned in your supervisions and or tutorials and in your lectures and classes and look further into those. So you might be using that independent study time to prepare for, for your supervisions. Um, you might be using it to explore another area or prepare an essay. There's a whole range of sort of things you can do with that time. But we expect a student will spend about 40 to 46 hours a week during term time studying. And that will be a combination of that independent study and all those other um, teaching opportunities. One of the things that we have at Oxford and Cambridge is what's known as a tutor at Oxford or a director of studies at Cambridge. And that person is responsible for overseeing your academic progress and welfare throughout your studies. So what that means is that they'll be there to, to support you in your module choices. Um, and advise you on kind of your path through your studies, but they'll also be there to kind of keep an eye so that if your grades start slipping or you're really struggling with uh, academic aspect of your studies, they can kind of point you in the right direction and support you in that. They are also the person who will organise your, your supervisions or your tutorials. And then the other thing that we do at Oxford and Cambridge is we tend to have quite a lot of our assessment um, on some often all of our assessment at the end of the year rather than termly. Um, and that typically takes the form of exams. So it's worth thinking about what kind of assessment forms you like um, and um, whether that would suit you. What I would say is that because of the supervision and tutorial system, our students get very used to producing essays and um, kind of thinking critically in short spaces of time, because it's not unusual to have kind of essays due quite regularly. And therefore, people do kind of get more adjusted to this kind of exam essay setup and find it easier to go into that process. Tom, could I have the next slide, please? Obviously, we want your time at university to be the happiest it can possibly be and the most fulfilling time it can possibly be. But we do offer a lot of welfare and support services should you need them. So firstly, I'm going to talk about pastoral support. That varies across Oxford and Cambridge, but is, is similar in terms of the, the provision. It just differs in terms of the terminology. So at Cambridge, you'll typically have a personal tutor. Um, and at Oxford, oh, sorry, at Cambridge, you'll typically have a director of studies. And at Cambridge, you will at Oxford, you'll typically have an academic tutor. I think that's right. Um, and what that does um, it supports you in your studies. So it does all the provision that I've just been talking about in terms of guiding your studies and helping you and making sure that you're, you're happy throughout your studies, but also making sure that your academic attainment is on track. Um, in terms of pastoral support, 
there is um, the availability of college staff at Oxford and at Cambridge um, to support you and make sure that you're happy and healthy throughout your studies. And that person, one of the advantages of the college system, as Tom has already touched on, is that it really helps you. Um, it means that you know everybody. So um, the staff are there and they know you on a personal basis and they're able to support you throughout your studies and, and make sure that you're, you're happy. Um, the pastoral support available in colleges comes in numerous different forms. Um, so for instance, a lot of colleges will have college nurses and a non-denominational chaplain. So that chaplain can support you regardless of your faith. Um, and then some colleges might also have kind of counselling services available as well. In terms of financial support, both universities have bursaries available to students with household incomes below around the £42,000 a year mark. The bursary available to you will vary depending on your family's income, um, but you can find full information about that on our website. If you are struggling financially, you are always encouraged to have a conversation with your college or with the university. And it's very firmly our belief that no student should be discouraged from applying to Oxford and Cambridge as a result of worrying or being concerned about their finances. So definitely look on our websites for more information about that. The other thing to add here is that a lot of colleges will offer kind of finance packages as well to support you if there's a certain thing that you want to explore. So some colleges will offer, will offer travel funds, some colleges will offer um, research funds. So if there is an area that you really want to look into, but you're not able to do that because of your financial situation, they will support you in that. Also in terms of welfare and support, we have the disability services. So at Cambridge, this is known as the Disability Resource Centre, um, and they are there to support you should you have a disability. So we really encourage students to get in contact with the disability services at whichever university before they, what, when they apply to the university as the disability services can support them through that process. If you do have a disability, we encourage you to declare that on your UCAS form as well. Um, we won't make any decisions based on that and it won't impact our decision, but it does mean that we're able to support you throughout the process and make sure that you're getting the best experience possible for you and that it's really tailored to, to whatever your needs are. So we really recommend getting in contact with them um, and making sure that you, you declare that disability to whichever college you're applying to and on your UCAS form. The disability services support you throughout your time at university and are able to offer you a whole range of things to support you um, depending on your needs. So that might be having a note taker, having additional time in exams. Um, the, the kind of opportunities are, are really varied, so it's worth taking a look on their websites if that's something that is a concern for you. Um, the other thing they are able to do is support you should you be um, should you discover that you have a disability at university, they'll be able to support you through that process as well. Next up, we've got the university counselling services. So both universities have got counselling services available. As I said before, obviously we want you to have the best time at university, but we appreciate that's not always the case. Um, so these services are available for you to kind of book into. You can self-refer to both of them and have a discussion about how you're feeling and the things that are going on. If you want to, your college can also support you in that process. The other advantage of the college system um, and more broadly the universities is we, we have a really strong peer support network. So what that means is basically students helping students. Um, all of the colleges have got what's known as a student union or a junior common room committee. And that's a group of students who often have kind of welfare reps available, um, and representation for the different liberation groups. And they're able to offer you kind of guidance, well, not so much guidance as um, facilities and support throughout your time um, and referrals to the places that you think would be useful. For instance, if you were struggling with something, your welfare rep in your college might say, have you considered going to the university counseling service? So that's sort of how it works, but they're able to support you with a lot of those sort of um, challenging things like homesickness and fitting in and and all of those things that everybody experiences when they come to university. Um, last but not least we have the family system and what that is is 
not entirely unique to Oxford and Cambridge, but it's definitely something that sets us apart. So as a first year, when you start at university, you'll be assigned to two or three people in the year above you um, who can be known as your college father and mother, college mum and dad, um, a pair of college mums, a pair of college dads. And usually there'll be people who um, are there to support you throughout your studies. Quite often they'll be doing the same subjects as you. And they're there to just really kind of support your transition into university. Um, it's, it's something that a lot of people love about the college system. It's a really fun way to engage with, with people across the different years and across different subjects. Um, and sometimes really random things happen, like you meet your great, 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 great college grandfather, who actually is only five years older than you. So there's lots of fun things around that too. Next slide, please, Tom. There are lots of kind of excellent employment prospects at both Cambridge and Oxford. We are regularly ranked um, as some of the best universities in the country for graduate employability. There's loads of opportunities to explore your potential careers while you're studying as well. So that could take the form of attending some of our careers fairs, um, speaking to our careers staff. We have loads of careers appointments available for students. Um, accessing a lot of the resources that we have available both online and at our careers libraries. So it's definitely worth um, going and checking those resources out as well. Um, and also we offer a huge amount of internships and work experience. So Cambridge, for instance, typically offers around 1,500 internships a year through the careers service that they're able to support you with. So there's loads of opportunities to engage with different potential careers. One of the good things about Oxford and Cambridge is because we have quite short term times that frees you up with a lot of time in the summer to go and explore your interests, be that in the form of an internship or by traveling and doing some research. So there's lots of freedom to, to go and kind of explore different avenues that are of interest to you. Finally, if you go to Oxford or Cambridge, all of our students will have lifelong access to the career service. So if you find five years down the line that actually you don't like the career that you've ended up in and you'd like to consider something new or you need someone to look over your CV, you're very welcome to come back to the career services at both universities and ask for support with that. Next slide, please. So next up, we're gonna talk about how you can make a competitive application to both universities. Next slide. Next slide, please, thank you. Um, and in this section, we are broadly going to look at what we as universities look for in applications, the key information that we use when selecting um, the students that we're gonna make an offer to, how you can develop your subject interests, the subject that you're applying for, how you can explore that and talk about that um, throughout the process of applying to Oxford and Cambridge key aspects of the admissions process for both universities and how they differ. differ. Um, and lastly, how we think you could prepare for interviews. So I'm gonna hand back over to Tom now and he's gonna take over. Thanks Millie. Um, so I also saw that some of you may have had some issues with hearing me. So hopefully it's slightly better now I've taken off my headphones um, so I can hear better myself anyway. Um, but if we move on to, um, what do we look for? Um, so uh, admissions decisions are based on academic criteria, um, mainly ability, um, but also potential to be successful at Oxford or Cambridge. So it's, it's quite a, it's meritocratic. So it's based on how, how well you do academically, essentially. Um, so what, what we look for in students, the students who are academically able and in, enjoy a challenge, um, students who have a knowledge, uh, a sound knowledge base and range of skills. So that's with the potential to go beyond the syllabus and use this knowledge in unfamiliar situations. Um, students who are, are well suited to the course applied for uh, and will benefit from and thrive um, in the learning environment we offer. Um, so that, and that again, is something you've already mentioned, but it's including how you will um, assess or how well, how, how we assess and how well you will be able to be assessed, mainly by exam. Um, students who show genuine interest in their subjects uh, or subject um, through wider engagement. So that's expressed through uh, an interest in new ideas. Uh, and an enthusiasm for reading or exploration around a subject and, and also students who have um, self-discipline, self-motivation and, and commitment. All really, really important um, things for, for, for you to have to, to have a successful application. Um, we are interested to hear about activities outside of or beyond school um, that are relevant to the course, um, but 
we won't really consider those that, that are not related, um, although other universities may. Obviously, bearing in mind that your, your personal statement is for all the universities that you apply for in the application year. Um, but, but we only really want to hear about academic stuff, really. Um, most important, though, is, is, is to remember that we consider all applications holistically and look at all parts of the application. Uh, we aren't looking for students from particular schools or backgrounds, just students who we know will enjoy the academic challenge of our, of our courses. Um, some key information used in, in selection uh, is as follows, and I'll, I'll break down each one of these on, 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 this, uh, on this diagram. Um, because admissions to both Oxford and Cambridge is highly competitive, um, to fairly assess our applicants, we look at all of the available aspects of each application. So as I mentioned earlier, it's a holistic view of everything. Uh, and uh, all available elements are considered together and nothing is considered in isolation. Um, so to break, break this down, um, we look at acad academic achievement. So this takes form through your performance in school leaver exams, uh, your performance in any admissions tests or written assessments and submitted or written work if, if required. Um, so that could be a new piece of work that you're asked to do or a couple of pieces of work that you may have done already while at school. Um, we also look at your UCAS application. Um, so this is your personal statement and the reference provided by your teacher. Um, we go into these a little bit next, um, but remember there's a lot of guidance available on both the university's websites. Um, if you get asked for an interview, uh, this will also help the admission staff piece together um, if you receive an offer or not. And I, I think Millie will talk about interviews later. And, and finally, both universities will also take contextual data in, into account. Um, so this can be pretty wide ranging, but will include whether a student has spent any time in local authority care, um, the uh, you know, your school's performance at GCSE and A-level, um, levels of progression to higher education in your area. Um, and, uh, and again, both universities have full information on, on websites with regards to contextual data too, if, if you wanted to look into that. But as mentioned before, it's based on you and your academic capability and it looks at all of these things not just anything within isolation um, so personal statements is something that we we always get asked upon and so it's really handy to to go into that and talk a bit bit further so this is this is where you can write whatever you'd like to say about yourself and your motivation to study the course that you've chosen um, you can only write one personal statement and it's important to remember that the same wording will be seen by all universities you apply to so obviously if you start saying specifically that you want to apply to oxford or cambridge those other universities may be like well hold on a second why have you sent this to us or why have you written it this way so that is a really important thing to remember um, your focus should be on the subject not the universities themselves um, the tutors are only really interested in your ac academic ability as mentioned and your potential and how committed you are to the subject or subjects. So saying you have, have a passion is not enough. You need to evidence why and how you're engaged with this passion that you have for this subject. Um, yeah, so just saying a you have a passion for it is, is never really going to be enough, I'm afraid. Um, so when we look at structuring your personal statement, as you can see here, we've got 80% academic and 20% extracurricular. So we that's what we recommend you do. Spend 80% of your personal statement on your academic interests and 20% on extracurricular because I guess they are still very much important to show you know how, who you are and what you do but really again it's it's academic based so it's a myth that we're both looking for the most well-rounded applicants with a long list of extra, extracurricular you know activities obviously again if you apply to other universities you'll need to cater for that too and um, but again we look at academia academic side of things so admissions tutors consider each application carefully on its individual merits. They look for evidence of your commitment and ability. Uh, and if you use your personal statement to develop, uh, sorry, to demonstrate your academic abilities and your engagement with your subject um, or subjects, then your application will be memorable for all the right reasons because, oh, wow, this person's done this, this and this, and they've got this interest in, and, and, and whatever it is. So it's really, really important. Um, one extra area as well that's always worth um, talking about on your personal statement is super curricular activities. Um, essentially, um, super curricular activities include anything that you've done that enhances your subject interest outside of your school studies. Um, so evidence of these activities are really important um, because to do well at either Oxford or Cambridge, you need to show enthusiasm and curiosity for the subject. 
um, but also how you're able to deal with independent study, which is obviously a very big thing uh, at both universities too. You can be doing, you're expected to do, you know, essentially a full-time job, so 40 hours of, of you know, of, of work a week on your studies. Um, so it's pretty full on and it's very much independently led. So you need to make sure that you can prove uh, that you can do that. And obviously this is a great way to evidence it. Um, so you may have been doing extracurricular activities already, but even, sorry, supercurricular activities, but even if you haven't planned or haven't planned on doing some, you may be doing some super curricular activities already. This isn't an exhaustive list, um, but you can see how varied the activities can be. So it could be TED Talks, podcasts, academic competitions, museums, galleries, site visits that link with your subject, um, subject specific magazines, science experiments at home, memberships of societies, blogging, vlogging, and so on. There's loads of different areas that would be considered to be super curricular. And again, you, you can, as long as you can talk about these and evidence them, um, then go for it. It's a great way to show that you have this interest and curiosity um, in your subject area. And, and then um, just a bit more, more continued really is, is that if it links with your subject and you can show how it furthers your enthusiasm, then it's super curricular. Um, so we've got here directed reading and project work. Um, they're great as well to have. And it, you know, the point is if you've done these things, then you can talk about them and talk around them really easily when you, if you get to interview. Um, and you can obviously evidence these in your personal statement too. So there's lots of stuff going on here that you can talk about that, that will back you up. Um, and just the, the little box at the bottom here, the EPQ wouldn't form part of an offer, but obviously completing one shows that you've gone, again, you've gone that extra extra bit further to, to have an understanding of your subject or su subjects and, and their area. I'm gonna hand back over um, to Minnie now, who's gonna finish off the presentation. Hello everybody again. Um, so, and we've seen this question coming through a fair amount in the question in the Q&A section as well. This question of do I need work experience? If so, what does that look like? The first thing I'm going to say is that work experience isn't expected or required for any of our courses. So we don't say you categorically have to have work experience, otherwise you won't be offered a place. That is never something that we say and we always look at the opportunities available to the student um, as well as um, like taking into account kind of all the studying and, and super curricular engagement that they've done. So generally speaking if you're applying for um, kind of social sciences arts course a lot of STEM degrees we'd rather you spend that time thinking about kind of the additional reading, supercurricular engagement and things you can do than worrying about finding work experience and thinking about how you can really talk about that in your personal statement. Having said that, if you do have work experience that is relevant and you do want to talk about that in your personal statement, then great, go for it. So say if you're applying for archeology span and you've been on an archeological dig, talk about it. We really wanna know about those sorts of things. The only time that we say that work experience might be useful is if you're applying for some vocational courses, for example, medicine or veterinary medicine and occasionally engineering, maybe. Um, and we recommend that, I'll talk about engineering separately in a minute, but for medicine and veterinary medicine, we recommend that you get some experience because it, it demonstrates a commitment to the career that you're interested in and it demonstrates that you've experienced something of that career in order to understand what it is that you're applying for because the last thing we all want to do is for you to apply to medicine thinking you really want to do it and then get into it and think, I really don't want to be a doctor because that's not a happy situation for anybody. Um, and it will give you a greater, this work experience will give you a greater understanding of the realities and pressures associated with that career. Having said that, and this is a key caveat, we appreciate that in times of um, the pandemic, it's harder to get work experience. And it might be that you are, um, you had work experience booked in and you've not been able to do it, or um, you've approached lots of people, but they're unable to offer work experience as a result of social distancing um, or being generally careful. So what should you do? Well, if you're applying for medicine particularly, it's worth looking into other volunteering opportunities. So for example, volunteering um, with a local uh, coronavirus initiative in terms of supporting people in the local community, um, it's worth looking into virtual um, options. So for example, I think Brighton and Sussex Medical School maybe have produced a, a like virtual work experience environment. It's worth reading up on um, 
different points of view of what it's like to have that career. So you can really begin to understand what the career feels like. Um, and doing all of that will help you get a broader understanding of the career you're going into. If you're unable to access um, any kind of, of work experience, that's absolutely fine too, but just try and do some research around what you would expect that career to feel like. Um, and then you're prepared to talk about that should it come up in your interview. Um, if you are doing engineering, I talked about work experience in that sense. Um, it's again, by no means a requirement. Uh, the one thing that is said is that sometimes engineering students will take a gap year um, and in that time they might look into some kind of engineering related field to get a bit of experience in that area and that is viewed um, it doesn't advantage or disadvantage the student but it obviously provides you with an insight into the different areas of engineering that you might be interested in. For veterinary medicine again it's about exploring kind of different opportunities to interact with animals but if you don't have the opportunity to do that in person um, it's worth kind of reading about it looking into it definitely check out the resources available on the medical research council website that talk about this um, and uh, expose yourself to as many kind of pieces of information about the career as you can even if you can't get involved directly in the work experience I hope that helps kind of aid some of the worries, but we're happy to obviously take questions around this as well, should you have further questions. Just to reiterate, if you're looking to do a career like law or English or anything like that, there's no need to have work experience. Next slide, please, Tom. So now I'm gonna talk about the supplementary application questionnaire or the SAQ, which is specific to Cambridge. Um, the supplementary application questionnaire gives us the chance to collect more information that is not part of the UCAS form. So when you submit your UCAS form to us by that deadline, which is the 15th of October, we will send you an SAQ form and that needs to come back to us by the 22nd of October. And it's divided into eight sections. You can find loads more information about this on our website, but there are a variety of topics that it covers. We will ask you for a photograph um, we do not expect kind of any glamour shots or anything like that. It's literally to make sure that the person that we have an application from is the same person that we're going to be interviewing so we can see who you are. Um, we'll also ask you to talk about the topics you've covered as part of your AS and A levels. Um, and that will help us understand kind of what your knowledge areas are so we can be more specific in the interviews about what we're asking you about. There's also an opportunity to submit an additional personal statement. You do not have to use this box. You will not be disadvantaged if you choose not to use it. But what it is useful for is that we recognize that some of the courses that we offer at Cambridge are different to courses that are offered in other universities. So it might be that everywhere else you're applying for physics and at Cambridge you're applying for natural sciences. And that would give you a great opportunity to talk about what attracts you to the natural sciences course specifically. So why are you drawn to the opportunity to study a greater range of subjects than just physics? You don't have to use that space, but if you would like to, you're very welcome to. Any other questions on the SAQ, there's a really handy guide on our website, so definitely make sure you check that out. Perfect, Tom, next slide, please. Um, admissions, tests and assessments and submitted work. So as you may be aware, we collect a whole bunch of information, as Tom has already talked about, around um, kind of testing your app, like looking into your aptitude for the subject prior to you coming to interview. At Oxford, these assessments are known as admissions tests. At Cambridge, they're known as admissions assessments. Um, and typically you can expect kind of three different tasks that we'll ask of you. Usually you'll only be expected to do one of a pre-interview assessment or test and an at interview assessment or test um, formally, though you might be asked to do additional assessments and tests depending on um, the college that you're applying to, or um, sometimes the subject will have multiple kind of opportunities to sort of have a look at your aptitude for the subject. You might also be asked to submit some written work prior to the interview. So here's our top information for preparing for these. So for pre-interview tests and assessments, you should register as you usually would. So you need to get that registration done by the 15th of October. Typically registrations will be done via your school. 
um, but that might not be the case. So make sure that you talk to your teachers about the process for, for registering for those assessments prior to the 15th of October. Um, have a look for your local test centre. If it's not based at your school, you can find all that information um, on the admissions website um, and on the Cambridge assessment website as well. Next up, check the resources that are available for practice. So on both the Cambridge and Oxford websites, there are various resources that give you kind of examples of what to expect. Um, sometimes examples of best practice um, and sort of just give you an insight into what test day or assessment day will look like. So be sure to, to check those out as well. Don't be afraid to give it a few trial runs before you actually go into the assessment or test. Um, last but not least, and this is really important, check the dates as some have been revised. I think all of them were scheduled for the 4th of November. Touch would definitely check that. But now as a result of social distancing guidelines, some of them have been moved to the 5th. So do double check the dates for the tests and assessments and make sure that you're turning up on the right day. For interview, so we sometimes do at interview tests and assessments. Um, and all we can really say at this stage is watch this space on that. We're working out currently the fairest way that we can do that. Um, making sure that, that you feel supported throughout the process while simultaneously kind of getting an insight into your aptitude for the subject. Um, we will post information as soon as we know it on our website to confirm what it is that's going on. The last thing that we want to do is say now, this is the plan, and then three weeks down the line have to change that plan and mess you all around. Last but not least is the submitted work. So depending on the subject you're applying for, I stress, because obviously some subjects won't ask for this, whereas some might, you might be asked to submit one or two essays that you'd be happy to discuss. This is to get a feel for your style of writing um, and an idea of sort of how you express yourself. We recommend that you look over these prior to your interview um, as, it will, as it might be something that is discussed during an interview. Um, generally speaking, we say that those essays should be marked by a teacher so we can kind of get an insight into how the teachers viewed them as well, but, but not always. So definitely make sure you check the course website to get further insight into that. Next slide, please. OK, so we're going to talk about interviews. It's called What to Expect. Um, and I'm, we're going to talk about interviews in, in the broader sense. So looking at them in what you could expect in any year. And then I might touch on also what you can expect this year. Um, so generally speaking, interviews, you can expect focused and challenging questions. So those questions are things that really encourage you to think. Um, they might be they'll typically start in things that you do know. Um, so their foundation might well be like within the curriculum, but then they'll encourage you to start to use your kind of knowledge of the subject and also your kind of deductive reasoning to be able to work out and explore beyond the things that you're really comfortable with. We ask you to use new approaches to examine your existing knowledge. So we might say, well, have you thought about looking at it this way? Or what about if you were to apply that to this? And you can expect prompting from interviewers and questions from you. So as I just said, you can expect the interviewer to say, well, have you looked at it this way? What if we were to apply that lens to this problem? Um, but also it's totally okay for you to turn around and say, I don't actually know what you mean by that. Um, can you talk, can you explain it to me? Or this is my thoughts, but, but what do you think? And that's totally fine to have that narrative. Interviews will usually cover something to do with your academic work. Um, and when I say they'll usually cover these things, they might cover two out of four, they might cover all four, um, they might cover just one. So academic work. So that might look at the essays that you've written and talk more broadly around those. Reading and supercurricular exploration. So they might start this off as a basis from your personal statement and they might say, we see you've read X, therefore can we chat about it? And you might have a discussion around that. Subject related wider awareness. So I'm really gonna stress here, we don't expect you to be an expert in your field before you even come to university. What we might expect you to do is if you're looking to study politics, be aware that Brexit is happening. We don't expect you to know everything about Brexit, but we might expect you to be able to talk a bit about um, like your knowledge of it 
and maybe previous things that you've studied and how that is an example for what could happen in Brexit, those sorts of things. And then lastly, and from discussions I've had with students and with staff, this seems quite a common um, area for interviews is to have prompt material. So they might, if you're doing a, a STEM interview, so sciences, um, engineering, maths, that might be in the form of a, a question. So they might kind of give you a mathematical equation and ask you to talk about it more broadly and work through it with you. And from the side of an art subject, this might be a poem or an extract from a book where they um, talk through it with you and work through it. And that kind of prompt material aspect is really designed to mimic what you would expect a supervision to be. So you'll be given a piece of um, prompt material and then you'll be encouraged to talk around it. So that is typically what you can expect. Um, the key thing to remember is there is no hidden agenda. Um, we're not trying to trick you into saying anything. Um, and last but not least, and this is really important, an interview is not, not the final hurdle. So when you get invited to interview, it's not saying, right, I passed every other stage and now I've got to pass this. An interview is about saying, okay, well, let's do an interview as well. And that will increase our knowledge of the, the student overall. Next slide, please, Tom. So in terms of the format you can expect for interviews, these are typically 20 to 45 minutes, depending on the subject um, and depending on how long you keep talking for. If you have a shorter interview, that's not indicative that you've not been successful. Likewise, if you have a longer interview, it's not indicative that you have been. Um, as I said, you get problem solving scenarios and discussions relevant to the course you've applied to. Um, and generally speaking, it's designed to be an assessment of your interest, aptitude, core knowledge, technical skills. And then, as I said, this capacity to learn from mistakes and to listen in discussion. So what that means is that if you've said in your personal statement, Pride and Prejudice is the best book in the world, and then you turn up and your um, interviewer says, well, how do you know it's the best book in the world? You're able to have that conversation with them. Um, it's okay if you want to defend your opinions in an interview, but also you need to be aware that it's important to listen and have those discussions. And it's also totally okay to change your mind and do a complete 180 and change your views completely. So there, there's no right way to do an interview, but please just be, be open to learning and try and enjoy it because it's a really great experience to talk about a subject that you're passionate about with somebody else who is equally passionate about it. Next slide, please. So in terms of how to prepare, um, have a look over your personal statement. Make sure you've read, watched, done all the things that you talk about in your personal statement. That's very important. Um, refresh your memory about the supercurricular work that you've done. So that could be going back over a particular podcast of interest, um, making sure that you're familiar with everything that you talk about. Um, having said that, we don't expect you to be able to, say if you mentioned the Canterbury Tales, Sorry, I did English at degree, which is why I'm using a lot of English examples. But say if you mention um, the Canterbury Tales in your personal statement, we don't expect you to then be able to recite the whole of the Canterbury Tales, but having some familiarity with it would be helpful. Um, then also practice discussing your academic work and ideas. By that we mean, don't be afraid to um, speak to a teacher or a friend or a family member. Um, and discuss the ideas either that you've put forward in your personal statement or ideas more generally, um, and really kind of think about those and answer the questions that they put to you. And both universities have got some great films online about the different interviews and what you can expect. So be sure to check those out as well. Next slide, please. Right, in summary. So first things first, choose the right subject. Don't agonize over it, but what we mean by this is you should be choosing the subject that you are passionate about or the subject that you're most passionate about. So make sure that you're not kind of looking at it and thinking, well, that subject is gonna have less applicants. So I'm gonna to apply to that one for a chance to get into Oxford and Cambridge, because what we're really looking for is a student who, who loves their subject because they're gonna be studying it intensively for three or four years, and then they might go on to continue studying it or working with it after that. So we really want that to shine through in your personal statement and in your interview if you have one. Secondly, explore your subject. Read about it, listen about it, do access the resources that you can to find out more about it. 
And then importantly, think about it and think critically about it um, and then talk about it. So you get used to expressing your ideas verbally. Take time to consider the colleges, as Thomas said, um, the colleges are a key part of your community while you're at university, but please don't agonize over this because at the end of the day, whichever college you end up in, um, students tend to tend to love their colleges um, and are very um, proud to be a member of their college. So please don't worry too much about it. And then for your personal statement, we recommend that you're honest, firstly, as we've talked about, you're selective. So rather than talking about every um, book you've read and every experiment you've seen since you were seven years old, talk about the ones that, that really mattered, really appealed and really acted as a springboard for you to go on and do further research. And don't be afraid to be critical. So in your personal statement, you can apply a post-colonial point of view or um, compare two books and talk about why you find the comparison interesting. So don't be afraid to do things with the material and really engage with it in your personal statement. Um, remember that we view every application holistically. So if say, for example, your GCSEs aren't really strong, but your A-levels are really strong, we, we'll look at those things in the round. We don't look at any one thing and say, right, we're not giving that person a place. So remember that we view everything um, and try to consider the student as kind of a whole person as opposed to just their grades or just their personal statement. And last but not least, as we've said, make sure you engage with the interviewers during the interview. Um, put your points forward, don't be afraid to defend them, but also don't be afraid to change your mind if you want to. Cool, next slide please. Frequently asked questions. So just to jump back to this, can I apply to both Oxford and Cambridge? Um, in short, you cannot apply to both Oxford and Cambridge in the same year. This applies to international students. This applies if you're if you're studying different courses. Say if you apply to, to Oxford for classics and Cambridge for um, English, you still can't do that within the same year. What you could do is apply to Oxford this year, not get a place or decide to, to not take up your place and then apply to Cambridge the next year if you really wanted to. Is there a minimum GCSE requirement? Generally speaking, um, there is, there isn't really a minimum GCSE requirement. Um, Tom might be able to speak more specifically about, about the Oxford GCSE requirements in a second, um, but it's worth, but generally speaking, there won't be a GCSE requirement. It's worth looking at the GCSE advice if you wish to do medicine and you're looking to undertake the BMAT. For Cambridge, there are no requirements no requirements at all and no minimum number of A's and A stars. Having said that, typically a student looking to study at Oxford or Cambridge will have a relatively strong GCSE profile um, and typically successful applicants will have a relatively large number of a, a relatively high proportion of higher grades. Typically we, we would expect to see the higher grades in the subject areas that they're most interested in. So if you're applying for, for physics, we might expect you to have, well, if you're applying for natural sciences, we might expect your science portfolio at GCSE to be particularly strong. Um, all of the GCSE data that we get, we look at in context. So we won't just look at it and say, well, this person's got seven, um, got great grades and this person's got okay grades. We'll look at it and say, um, well, this student has got, um, great grades in comparison to a school that's also got great grades and in comparison to a, a wider um, geographical area that's doing really well, whereas this person's grades are actually particularly exemplary in comparison to their peers. Are some colleges easier to get into than others? Entry requirements are broadly the same across all colleges. Um, for Cambridge, the only differences might be in terms of the subject preferences the college sets out. So say, for instance, um, one college might say we want you to have maths, further maths and physics, and one college might say we want you to have maths and physics, but we're not so worried about the further maths. So definitely take a look at the guidance on our websites to find out more about that. Um, Oxford wise, the admissions requirements and process is the same for all colleges. Um, and at Oxford, you're more likely to be interviewed by more than one college. We have extensive moderation across the colleges and subjects at both Oxford and Cambridge to ensure that we're all assessing to the same standards and that admission is not dependent on college choice. So what this means is that a college would rather have a stronger candidate 
at another college, then keep uh, a candidate who's not, strong, not as strong in their own college. So colleges will often share candidates across different colleges to make sure that we're taking the strongest candidates in any year. What extracurricular activities will help my chances of admission? As Tom's already said, um, we're interested in your supercurricular activities um, and your academic profile. We're not very interested in your extracurricular activities. Having said that, we understand that other universities might be interested in your extracurricular activities. So be sure to um, talk about them in your personal statement, but just don't let them take up too much space. Um, we expect to see them in personal statements because we know other universities love to hear about them. We also really encourage you to take part in extracurricular activities while you're at university, before university, as it is a great way to relax, make friends and um, make the most of your university experience. We just don't worry about them in this context. Do you offer a club, society or sport that I'm interested in? Probably yes. Um, it's worth taking a look at the, the website for more information about extracurricular activities. We offer a huge range of different options from campaigning groups to art clubs. Um, if a club doesn't exist that you want to take part in, you're very welcome to set this up yourself um, with the support of the student union and you can participate at various levels, be that college based or university level. Next slide, please. And now it's time for questions. Perfect, thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. I have also been trying to type answers as, as many answers as possible um, uh, in the chat as well. So um, I guess I'll hand over to, to, to Megan now, I think, potentially for, for, for the last bit of the session. Or I could be wrong. Sorry, I just need Martin to reactivate my video. There we go. Perfect. Thank you very much for the presentation, Millie and Tom. That was absolutely amazing. So much information in there. If you do have to go back to lessons at 1pm, the webinar is available on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can re-watch that at any time and catch up a little bit later if you need to. It's UK University Search. And if you registered on Zoom, we will send you the link by email in a little while as well. Um, before we answer some of your questions, we also wanted to use the webinar today to give you some more details about Meet the Russell Group, which is our virtual event on Wednesday, the 7th of October. I hope that the presentation from Millie and Tom provided you with lots of information if you are already applying for Oxford or Cambridge or inspired you too if you were thinking about it. Um, we did answer some of your questions and we're going to do some more in a little while, but there have been a large volume today. So to make sure that you get the answers that you like, you can use the resources that Millie and Tom have already suggested, or you can also register for the Meet the Russell Group event. Um, all 24 Russell Group universities will be there. You can visit their booths, download documents, resources, view information about access and bursaries, student finance, and live chat with representatives to ask any questions you have. We'll also be doing 12 live webinars just like this one on a huge range of topics. Um, so you can take part in those and ask questions during them as well. And um, the link for that is russellgroup.vfairs.com. That is just in the chat if you're watching on Zoom and we'll pop it in the chat on YouTube as well. Okay, so let's dive into some questions. I'm gonna start with a question for Tom today. Will my choice to take a creative subject at A-level, such as art, impact my application to study a science? I'd like to say no, but I mean, essentially, when I mentioned, and I think Millie mentioned it too, with um, prerequisites. So if you're going to be studying a, a science subject, the, and both universities will do this, but that they will say that, as I mentioned about biochemistry, is that, you know, you must, must have done chemistry, um, uh, A-level or equivalent. Um, obviously, if you haven't done that, but you're still able to show uh, in your personal statement, in your supercurricular activities around that, the interest in, that, you, that you have and, and the further study that you've got into and all the evidence of you looking, you're wanting to do this science subject, then that's still a good thing. And you, you, you can then use your personal uh, statement and, and potentially your teacher reference as well to show why you want to do science as a, because you, you, know, you haven't done a specific subject at, at A level. Um, so it's not ideal, but you're still able to talk around it. I, th I, th I think that's the most important thing is, as we both mentioned here, it's really about how you can show the admissions tutors um, in, in 
the evidence of, of why you want to study the subject. So if you're able to sh say, I, I'm doing this at A level, however, I really want to do this, um, then that's probably a stronger case uh, and a more memorable um, personal statement in this case for admission students to go, oh man, this, this, this person really is really keen on this. However, again, you've still got to go along with the end requirements. As, as I showed on that, on that one slide, you have all of those different aspects that we take into account. So it's not going to be just about one thing. It's about the holistic view of all of those things. So the contextual data, your personal statement, your teacher reference, the interview, if you, if you get to the interview stage. Um, so it's about showing your evidence around it. Um, so while I say, well, I'm not going to say it's, it's not ideal, it's still something that you can certainly uh, talk and walk around. Perfect, thank you, Tom. One for Millie. Now, I'm sure you probably get this one a lot, Millie. Um, but why can't students apply to study at both Oxford and Cambridge? Um, the general reason for this is that we have, as you've seen today, quite a lengthy application process. Um, we try and find out as much information and as much insight into each student as we possibly can. Um, and both universities are quite competitive as well. And what that means is that were students to apply to both universities, typically a lot of students would apply to both institutions, um, which would take up a lot of space in their UCAS application. Um, but what it also means is that we would end up in a situation where we were, we were going through double the information and trying to process that and make sure we were getting everybody in for an interview. So just logistically, um, it, it's not that practical to do it that way. And also we want to make sure that each student has that really kind of tailored experience as far as possible. Um, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Tom, but... Just, just, just a little bit, really, in a sense of um, I, I think, as, as many mentioned, it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of work in logistics as well. But I guess that for some of these courses, um, especially at, at both universities, there, there's only really a, a few places for each one. That work. there may only be a, a small amount of students that want to do those that subject, and so to to give a fairer chance for both universities that offer these smaller courses to give students a better chance to be able to get onto that course uh, as as well, um, just as an extra added point. Perfect, thank you, Tom and Millie. And uh, one for Tom now. How do you recommend students balance working and university study if they want to take part-time work whilst they're at uni? Um, so, and I'm pretty sure it's the same for Cambridge uh, at Oxford, but we, we discourage students to work during term time, um, mainly because it's essentially, it's a full-time job to study that subject anyway during, during the week. Um, and and we also I mean the colleges and and and, and I, I work with our ambassadors at the university here as well. We we also want to encourage that they have you know a good well being outside of their studies too. So that downtime is really important as well. So if if you're having to do this vast amount of study as well as contact studies and with lectures and tutorials, and then to go and do a, a job as well at the same time, it is tough. So we we really discourage work during term time. However, terms are short, like eight weeks. So you have more a lot more time off than you do you know on studies and that non-term time is, is a fantastic opportunity to get part-time jobs and uh, Millie you mentioned the career service as well so the career service can find internships or we, we at Oxford we have a um, a uh, part-time casual career service as well that can find placements for it too I mentioned ambassadors and I'm sure it's the same with Cambridge we, we we use our current students they're our best resource for when we do events so we have something called unique uh, and we use our student ambassadors um, to, to help us um, on these events, we pay them for it too. Um, it's a bit like volunteering, but you're paid for it. You still get the feel good factor of, of doing kind of volunteering work, but you get paid for it at the same time. And again, these are all outside of outside of term time. Um, so yes, it sounds, it sounds pretty uh, sort of macabre saying, no, you can't work during term time, but there are opportunities, more opportunities outside of, of term time for you to do it. And it's better just to focus on your studies because it will be pretty full on. Perfect, thank you, Tom. One that we had um, quite early on in the webinar was about online interviews. Millie, do you have a bit more information for students who are worried about doing their interviews online? Sure. Um, so this is a popular question at the moment. Um, and the easy answer is that we will be literally putting all of the information on our website that we're able to um, as soon as we're able to offer more guidance. It is true, and Tom will be able to chip in on this from an Oxford perspective, but we've decided that all interviews at Cambridge this year will be taking place online. Um, we are optimistic that we'll be able to deliver this um, in a really strong way and use a lot of virtual resources in order to have a similar experience to that that you would have 
were you interviewing in person? I think um, I saw a question where someone said that they were worried that their passion for the subject wouldn't transfer well on camera. I would say one of the things you've really got to remember is that we are interviewing absolutely everybody on camera this year. So everybody will be in, in the same boat. Um, and it's, it's a really good opportunity to, to talk about your love of the subject. We wanted to keep the interviews because um, they are a really good insight into applicants' approaches to the subject and what we call teachability. So how kind of much they want to engage with the, the lecturers and the supervisors and things like that. Um, we appreciate it's frustrating that they can't happen in person as well. Um, but please do remember, everybody's in the same boat. We'll be using all of the resources that we can to engage you effectively. Um, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, oh, and check the websites to make sure that you're, you're looking there for all the most recent updates because they'll be placed online when we've got them. Perfect, thank you, Millie. Tom has just sent over the links for all the COVID advice for Oxford and Cambridge, so I popped them in the Zoom chat. We will also pop them on the post webinar email as well to make sure everyone's got them. So thank you, Tom. Uh, we have a question for you now, Tom, if you wanted to say something else before we move on. Please, thanks, Megan. It's just really just to, to, to also say that it's practice as well online. Um, <laughs> I don't know, give, give a give an interview transcript to a friend, a grandparent, a parent, whatever, and, and practice online too, because, um, and this is something that I, Millie and Megan may be able to agree with me here, but um, even presenting in an online format when you're not used to it, and, and for me, you know, just having a blank screen is, is tough, really tough, uh, and it, you, you will get better, better with, with practice, so take opportunities to practice doing interviews online. Uh, as well. It may sound silly, you, you could do it face to face, but even if it's in the same house, go to different rooms, make sure one of you's got headphones on so there's no feedback and, and give it a try. And just to add to that as well, don't be afraid to, um, as strange as this might sound, use your camera functionality to record yourself as well and watch it back um, and use that as an insight into how you interact with the camera. But overall, we're not expecting anyone to be perfect at this. It's the first time we've all done it. Um, so, so don't try not to worry too much about it if possible. Thank you very much, guys. I'm sure they'll find that advice really useful. Uh, one for Millie. Do you recommend specific colleges for different subjects and can students apply to more than one college? Ah. Um, the short answer is, is no. Most colleges will teach all subjects. There are a few colleges that might not teach one or two. You can find all of that information on our website. So um, if you go to the general admissions website, you can find our course listing. And if you click on there, it will tell you which colleges offer the subject. So it's worth looking there. Um, generally speaking, most of your teaching will take place. So your, your lectures, your practicals, things like that will take place in your department. So they'll run across the university um, and you will mingle with people from other colleges all of the time when you're doing that. Your supervisions or your tutorials might be organized within your college. So they'll be organized by your director of studies. But if, for example, there's not a suitable supervisor in your college, all that will happen is you'll go to another college and, and work with the supervisor there. Or say, for example, there is a supervisor in your college, but not somewhere else. Some students from another college might come to you. So we work really hard to make sure that the academic experience is the same across all of the colleges wherever possible. Um, and in answer to the second part of that question, you can only apply to one college at either Oxford or Cambridge in any one year. But if you don't mind which college you're applying to, um, you can do that thing, which is um, submitting an open application at either Oxford or Cambridge. And what that means is, as Tom's already explained, is that your application would just go, um, would be assigned to a college and they won't know, I don't know for the Oxford setup, but definitely at Cambridge, they don't know that you've submitted an open application. So they'll just see you as though you've applied to them directly. And that won't disadvantage your application at all. Um, so, so that's your best option if you can't choose a particular college. Perfect, thank you. Did you want to add anything to that, Tom, or are you happy? Yeah, no, that, 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 that's, that's great. I think Millie's, Millie's covered it fantastic. It's the same system. That's great. Um, we've got just one more question today. Um, as I'm aware, we are a little bit over our time limit, but I'm sure you don't mind. <laughs> Lots of useful information anyway. Uh, one for Tom. In terms of the application process, will applicants taking three A-levels be judged any differently from those who've taken four or more A-levels? Um, not really. I mean, again, if we talk about if you're researching which course you want to do um, at either Oxford or Cambridge, there are inter-requirements um, 
uh, on, on the website for each course. So you'll see that, you know, maybe three A's, an A, and, uh, a star and two A's or whatever it is with prerequisites. Um, obviously, if you've done an extra A level, um, then you, you're showing, yeah, as long as you've done well in it, you know, it's, you know, if you get four A's, fantastic. If you get three A's and, and a D, that may, you know, that may show that, or oh, maybe you're not able to take on the extra commitment of an extra A level. But if you do well, it's evidence of you being able to to deal with the demand of, of more academia than than taking three A levels. Um, so it, it's not a bad thing, uh, you know, really, unless you you really struggle in that extra A level. But I'm assuming here that if you're able to take on or you want to take on those four A levels, it's because you feel like you're able to do it. And again, you're able to then evidence that in your personal statement. Um, as well so it, it, it's, it's it's certainly a, a benefit to have perfect thank you very much tom was there anything you'd like to add millie or you're happy um just to jump in on this um, we do understand as well that not all colleges can offer four a levels so if you're in a scenario where you're only taking three and only able to take three that's totally fine as well um the one thing I would say is if you're looking to do a subject which is very like maths oriented and you're not able to pick up further maths and further maths isn't a requirement, you can always opt to take a few additional modules of further maths in your own time in independent study. And that's a great way to kind of show your interest in the subject and explore more specific areas. But overall, completely agree. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, that was our last question for today. As we've mentioned throughout the webinar today, if you do have more questions for the University of Oxford or the University of Cambridge, please come along to our virtual event that's happening in two weeks time on Wednesday, the 7th of October. It's taking place from 12pm to 6pm. So you'll have lots of time to log on and chat to different universities, colleges, um, just universities, sorry, that was the wrong one. <laughs> 24 Russell Group universities on that one. So you can talk to any of them. Um, you don't have to log on and just talk to one. You can chat to all of them about what they can offer you um, and ask any questions that you have. We will send you the link to register for that um, in this email after this session as well. And it's in the chat along the side if you're on Zoom. Okay, we also have another warm up webinar taking place next week, and this one is a more general one which is applying to Russell Group Universities. We have had a change of the panellists, so instead of the University of Edinburgh joining us, it will be the University of Glasgow next week, and they'll be joining Queen's University Belfast, Cardiff University, the University of Liverpool, University of Southampton and University of Warwick. Um, so all six of them will be joining us. They'll have five minutes each to chat to you a little bit about what it's like to study at a Russell Group University and provide you with some application advice. So make sure you don't miss that one. It's um, the same time next week, 30th of September at 12 o'clock. Um, you can register on our website. That's www.ukuniversitysearch.com. And you should just click on the purple autumn activities button. Then you'll be able to scroll down and find the link at the bottom of that. We'll also send you the link through if you've registered on Zoom as well. Okay, thank you very much to Millie and Tom for joining us today. Um, it was a really informative session and I hope you learned lots about applying to Oxford or Cambridge, whichever one you do end up choosing. Um, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye.